Good morning, and welcome to Jubilee United Church on this foggy third Sunday of the Epiphany. I'm the Reverend Graham Brownler today. I have assistance from Lorna and Bob, and here at the church with me are Andrew and Deanna and Marcia. We're so glad that you have joined us from wherever you come from. Our reflection on the relationship that Indigenous peoples have had with the land leads us to engage in the work of reconciliation. That includes a reminder and acknowledgement of the lands on which we reside and on which we worship. This is the shared ancestral and unceded lands of the Hunkaminam and Squamish speaking peoples. We acknowledge with respect this land, and we covenant to live into the responsibilities which are ours, to learn, to engage, and to honor. We honor the uniqueness of who you are. Exactly who you are makes you, you, beautifully you. What is unique brings us together, our stage of life, our personalities, gender identity and expression, sexual orientation, language, skin color, culture, race, marital or economic status, ability, where you find yourself on your spiritual journey. You are welcome just as you are. No matter what you think might keep you from connecting to the source of all being, how great or little you feel your faith is, no matter if it's your first time coming to this or any church or you were raised here, or if it's your first time coming in a while, we strive to make this a place for you. We light this candle, remembering that we are connected with a host of souls from throughout the ages, those that came before and those that will come after. We pray that hope and love may fill our hearts and that we might carry the light, this light, the light of Christ with us always. And may the flickering flame dancing here in this space connect with the flame that is in your space and within each of you. Loud talkers and silent warriors, glad handers and lonely wallflowers, God gathers us together to be the body of wonder and joy, hope and healing. Bystanders with hands shoved in pockets, frady cats whose feet are frozen in place, Jesus calls us to carry grace to outsiders, to walk with all those left behind. Kids who never answer off, offer answers in class, bashful folks whose tongue tie in knots, the Spirit anoints us to speak up for the voiceless, to partner with the poor, to discover their gifts. We are called to worship together no matter what we think of ourselves, for God calls us. Let us pray. In a cynical and despairing world, O oh God, give us a quietly prophetic voice to proclaim your hope. In a violent and angry world, O oh God, give us quietly prophetic voices to proclaim your peace. In a dismissive and disinterested world, O oh God, give us a quietly prophetic voice to proclaim your compassion. In a lonely and inhospitable world, O oh God, give us a quietly prophetic voice to proclaim your love. In a grieving and weeping world, O oh God, give us a quietly prophetic voice to proclaim your joy. May we be so captivated by your hope, O oh God, that we cannot help but to whisper, to sing, and to enact the message of your reign, which is always coming into our world. And may our quietly prophetic lives be channels of your restoring grace wherever we may go. Amen. This morning when our children gathered, they talked about the woman with her two little coins, the gifts that we can give that uh, don't cost a lot, the things that we have that we can share with the world. The story we're going to hear today read is about Jesus' first recorded teaching in the synagogue, the first thing he gave to the people that had raised him up, even though he'd been around the, the Galilee area already doing some teaching. But we also know that in the Gospel of Luke, there was a story uh, about when he was 12 or 13, when he was separated from his family, he was found in the synagogue with teachers, quite similarly to what it means for him to share of himself. He did that for most of his life. And so we find ways for our children, for our youth, for our young at heart, all of you, to find those ways to share of yourselves, to share the things that don't cost a lot, the ways that you can help the world be a better place just by being. Let's hear our scripture. Okay. The first reading is from 1 Corinthians 
chapter 12, verses 12 to 31. It is a reading from the first letter uh, to those in Corinth. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, <clears throat> are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the Spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink from one, one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot were, foot were to say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. <laughs> and if the ear were to say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body. But the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed to the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. In our second reading, according to Luke 4, <clears throat> chapters 14 to 21. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee. And a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 
and he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. <laughs> the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Hear what the Spirit is saying through these ancient words of scripture. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be graced by your wisdom and your love. I read a reflection this past week that began, O oh body, how I love and resent you, want you well and want to flee you, see you as a thing as if from outside. How you have fooled me thinking I am we and all alone, a stone among stones, most at home with stones like me. Now, I know the author was writing about the reading from 1 Corinthians 12, but after the past few weeks of dealing with my own body and medical stuff, I read it differently. It highlighted for me once again how we all read scripture differently, even Jesus. Steve Garnis, who I get an email from every day, says it this way. Watch how Jesus does scripture. The passage in Isaiah actually says, to proclaim the year of God's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. But Jesus stops with favor, leaves out vengeance and sits down. Some might call it cherry picking. Scripture is replete with images of God as vengeful and God as forgiving, but vengeance is not forgiveness. God isn't sort of this and sometimes that. You have to choose. You don't get both. Jesus chooses. He quotes Hosea, I desi desire mercy, not sacrifices. No matter what your sacred books say, we have to choose. The way of vengeance, power, and domination, or the way of courage, love, and nonviolence. Though he has every reason not to, Jesus chooses the side of love. And when he asks you and you falter, don't worry. He'll still choose the way of love. The story that Lorna read for us is at the very beginning of Luke's account of Jesus' public ministry. It's his account of how that public ministry begins. Though Jesus has been teaching around Galilee here, he arrives in Nazareth where he had been brought up. And it's the first time that we hear Jesus' teaching. The scene functions as kind of a manifesto, an inaugural address at the outset of his work. I find it intriguing that even though Jesus has been teaching around Galilee, Luke chooses this as the entry point for his ministry rather than an earlier time where Jesus was praised by everyone. We honestly have no idea how much we've missed of the teaching tour through the synagogues all over greater Galilee, but we're early in the gospel. It's just the fourth chapter. We've heard a lot of story already and it's had its ups and downs. Elizabeth and Zechariah and John Mary and Joseph and Gabriel, the travel to Bethlehem, Jesus' birth, the visitation of the shepherds, Jesus' dedication at the temple with Anna and Simeon. And then we skip to his teenage years where he gets separated from his family and they find him with the rabbis, a precursor to this story today. We heard of him as an adult, the baptism, where he's singled out by the Holy Spirit appearing as a dove in the heavenly voice calling, my child, the beloved followed by Jesus being driven into the wilderness. Four chapters. We've already had a lot of ups and downs. What a journey. Today helps solidify what we've already heard in those four chapters to answer the question, what is Jesus' mission all about? If we paid attention, we'll remember that Mary's Magnificat has told us already the point of his mission we hear those strong echoes in this passage that he chooses to read today to proclaim the dawn of the great jubilee, a new era of liberation, restoration, and return. And the good news comes for all, not just the free, but the captives, not the comfortable, but the disadvantaged and downtrodden. In this inaugural address, it is dealt that the gospel is above, it is clear that the gospel is above all else about God lifting the lowly. 
when I was at seminary, my history prof talked about history not being linear, but like a spiral. That similar events happen throughout history that are reminiscent of past and future occurrences. If we think of God working through history in a signature poetic pattern like that, then scripture and salvation history will rhyme. They will find a similar point on that spiral. Ancient motifs will resonate in current events and important current events will fulfill or fill out ancient motifs. It is as true today as it was in Jesus' day. Scripture's being fulfilled in and through contemporary events was a powerful and widespread notion. It wasn't just that they were a foreshadow of the future. It was also that the meaning of present events was to be revealed in them. For instance, think of Jesus being cast into the desert, the temptations he experienced there. The story is told, the dialogue is carried through words and ideas from Scripture, for it is written. So we wonder, did the Israelites' 40 years of wandering in the desert foreshadow Jesus' 40 days in the desert? Well, maybe. Or, as Luke tells the story, he places an emphasis on the opposite dynamic. Jesus' 40 days in the desert echoes the Israelites' 40 years wandering. Jesus doesn't only refer to the story, but he embodies its essential ideas and energies. He fulfills them, he reprises them, crystallizes them, incarnates them, fulfills them. In a similar way, Jesus' ministry echoes the ministries of prophets who came before him. Some were welcomed and others not, but what he says and teaches rhymes with the teachings that came before him, marking points on that spiral of history. It's what we strive for in church, to echo the teachings and stories of Jesus so that we can help bring about the kingdom of God as he demonstrates and tries to help bring to fruition. Jesus comes to the synagogue in his hometown and he takes the scripture. He finds the passage he wants to read from Isaiah and he reads it aloud to the point he wants and then he sits down. What he had read shouldn't be heard only as words of Isaiah long ago and far away, but heard as his own words then and there and here and now. They are words that are applied to him directly right before their eyes. He's attempting to bring about the things he had learned about from his mother, things that we have heard in the song she sang during her pregnancy. Jesus wants to bring about a great jubilee where debts are forgiven and all people gain freedom from what they found themselves in. But he also wants to remind people that jubilee isn't just for the poor. It's also for the health of creation as a whole, for everyone benefits when liberty and well-being extend across the entire neighborhood. The heart of jubilee is about the restoration of right relationship with other people, all people, and with the land and the creatures that we share the land with. The mission and vision that we as a community of faith agreed to six years ago now is called by God to be one by living faith, knowing love, voicing hope in worship, belonging, learning, and service. Even though we hadn't chosen the name Jubilee when we worked on that mission and vision statement, I think there is scriptural and salvation history rhyming between it and the great Jubilee. We're reminded that following Jesus isn't just about chasing our own salvation. It's about participating in God's restoration of the most vulnerable, proclaiming good news to the poor, helping to build a world worthy of that proclamation. And it is not just Jesus who can participate in the fulfillment of Scripture, the bringing about of the kingdom as dreamed by God. As members of the body of Christ, we too can rhyme with its classic forms and stories. It's a powerful lens for looking at the world. How can our lives embody these ancient patterns, participating in God's signature moves unfolding all around us? When the signature poetic pattern of God is explored, when our history and our present and our future are aligned with one another in the spiral, we are reminded that we are in this together. So I come to the end where I began with the reflection I read this week. Oh body, how I love you and resent you. 
There's so much in our history that is to be resented in the name of Christianity, but we are all connected and working together. We are seeking a better world, described by God and embodied by Jesus. No part of the body is any better than the other. And when Jubilee is experienced by the least, all of creation will be made better. Today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. May it be so in your life and in mine. Amen. Please join me as we lift our prayers together. Gracious God, we are yours. Our minds, our hearts, our souls, our bodies, all gift from you. Because we belong to you, we belong to one another and need one another. So take all that we are, the goodness and the flawed, and help us become what you would have us be. We give thanks for your mystery that created us, your grace that sustains us, your wisdom that challenges us, and your love that has redeemed us. We come to you in gratitude for all those who share their love in service. Healthcare workers, teachers, first responders, volunteers who feed the hungry, house the homeless, keep our food and supplies available, and for all who participate in and support our ministry here at Jubilee and Pacific Mountain Region. Lead us too into the world, not in fear, protecting ourselves from evil and the unknown, but in anticipation and trust, open to everyday challenges and miracles. And lead us together, we pray, that we be united in the same purpose. Open us, really open us, to the scripture that is fulfilled for us, looking for the good in the world and stirring us with the new life you have given us with the risen one. We come to you in humility, asking for forgiveness for any unkind and selfish words we spoke and actions we took and the kindness and generosity we failed to show. We look into our own souls and pray for ourselves. Our fatigue in this pandemic, our loss of fellowship, 
our attempts to celebrate the light amid challenges and disappointment. Guide our every choice. Make grateful and generous our hearts. And we come to you in hope as we pray for your people, for those who are suffering the pain of sickness, loneliness, fear, or loss, for those who suffer often unnoticed from the pain of memory loss, depression, confusion, broken hearts and souls, for those who are held captive by others or their own violence or greed, those who know or see no other path beyond that of destruction. We pray for those who are hungry, whose stomachs are empty, who hunger to belong, to be part of something life-giving, who hunger for meaning and life in the spirit, who hunger for freedom from injustice and fear. We pray for those who pray and those who do not remember how, for those whose names are in the headlines and those who are forgotten, for those who repent and for those who believe they are beyond redemption. We pray for the land, the sea, and the sky that we may truly live with respect in creation and use your gifts with reverence. We pray especially today for Ken and Melina and the Larsh community that supports them. We pray for Graham, Deanna, Justin, Andrew, who keep our weekly ministry going amid their own health and safety challenges. We pray for the Thrifties, the executive team, the core ministries, the Sunday school and the youth group as they find ways to work through these challenging times. Holy One who hears all prayers, listen to us now as we name silently the people and situations that are in our hearts. Bless all these with your love and our care. Help us as we learn to follow and pray in the name of this body we seek to enliven, Jesus Christ, who taught us the greatest prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. There will be fellowship time uh, in breakout rooms following worship. You're welcome to stay. If you've never been, they're pretty fun. Uh, come and meet some new people. It'll be a good time. Bible study continues tomorrow. Uh, if you need to figure out how to connect to that, please be in touch. The thrift shop is open on Thursdays from 10 to 2. Sometimes I think there's a lot of things, and I hear we need more. Other times I think that there's not very much, and I hear we have too much. So keep bringing stuff in. Uh, we appreciate all of the things that we receive for donations. We're happy to get them. The annual meeting is going to be coming up in March. So anyone that should be writing a report, please start sending it into the office. Um, and if you don't know if you should be writing a report, then you can ask or someone will get in touch with you and let you know that there should be a report. But we're looking for middle of February to have all of those put together so that we can put together the booklet that will go out so that you all have a chance to read about some of the things that happened last year. Uh, there is still a lot, even when it doesn't seem like it. Deborah Legg, as chair of the executive team, is uh, going to give us an announcement too. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you all. Uh, we just wanted to uh, let you know we haven't forgotten about our search for our second ministry. Um, it is right now, we're still waiting for applications, but we are working on that and hope to bring a name to you in the future. But it's still going on. Just want to let you know we haven't forgotten. Have a great week, everyone. 
Thanks, Deborah. This week we celebrate birthdays of Tyler and Mary Lou and anniversary of Mike and Sally. Celebrate well and know that you're surrounded by prayers uh, from all of us here. Friends, we invite you to share God's abundance whenever. Like I talked about with the children, it doesn't matter how you give, it is that you give, whether that's of yourself, of your time, or of your financial gifts. Uh, that all of them help us continue our ministry here in our community of faith and around the world. There are a variety of ways by which you contribute. You can contribute if you feel so called. You can mail a check into the office or drop it off. Someone will come and pick it up if that's what you need. You could join PAR or send an e-transfer. There are a variety of ways. Know that however you decide to do that, your gift is appreciated and we are grateful for your generosity. Let's pray. Though many different amounts and ways when gathered up by you, our gifts become a food pantry, a rebuilt life, medicine for children, a caregiver to the lonely, a way to provide for community. All of these are your grace and action. In love, we offer these gifts in the name of Jesus. Amen. Go now and live as one body in Christ. Be at peace and care for one another. Suffer with one another and rejoice with one another. Give your attention to the word of God and proclaim the good news of freedom to all. And may God delight your heart and sharpen your vision. May Christ Jesus keep you th thought and word in grace. And may the Holy Spirit be the fountain that sustains you all and binds you together as one, now and always. Amen.